We meet today to consider three pending nominations. The three nominations are Ms. Laura Daniel Davis to be the Assistant Secretary of Interior for the Land and Minerals Management. Uh, Ms. Maria Robinson to be the Assistant Secretary of Energy overseeing the Office of Electricity. And Dr. Joseph D. Carolus. Is that close? I'm sorry to be the Administrator of the Energy Information Administration. All three of the nominees were nominated for these same positions last year, but the Senate did not take final action on them before the end of the session. Thus, all three of their nominations were returned to the President at the end of the first session under the standing rules of the Senate. All three were renominated by the President and are now back before us. Ms. Daniel Davis has been here before. The committee held a hearing on her nomination last September. Although the committee usually foregoes a second hearing in cases like this, we have held second hearings before when members had requested them. We very much appreciate your willingness to return, Ms. Daniel Davis, and to answer any additional questions members may have. Unfortunately, the committee was unable to schedule a hearing on Ms. Robinson and Dr. Carolis nominations last fall, so this is their first hearing. And we welcome all three nominees and thank each of them for being here this morning and their willingness to serve in these important positions. So welcome to each of you and your family members. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, as I said, Ms. Davis has been through this before. It is no reflection on her person, uh, personally that she has been called back for a second hearing. It is, I believe, a reflection on the importance of the office to which she has been nominated, the breadth of her portfolio, the interest of members of this committee have in the policies that her office oversees. The Assistant Secretary for Land Minerals Management oversees four of the Department of Interior the Bureau of Land Management, the Office of Surface Mining, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Members of the committee may disagree with each other and with the administration over the land and minerals management policies pursued by this administration, as we have with prior administrations. But no one should doubt that Ms. Daniel Davis's knowledge and experience or her commitment to public service. She served as Chief of Staff to the Deputy Secretary of Interior during the Clinton administration, and as Chief of Staff to the Secretary Salazar and Secretary Jewell during the Obama administration. She has been serving as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management for the past year. She had my support last year, and she has my support this year. Ms. Maria Robinson. Our next nominee is Maria Robinson, who has been nominated to head the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity. The Office of Electricity was established in 2005 to help modernize the electric grid, enhance the grid security, and reliability and to facilitate recovery from grid disruptions. The Assistant Secretary for Electricity is responsible for overseeing the department's research and development activities aimed at modernizing and strengthening the electric grid and for overseeing the four power marketing administrations. Ms. Robinson is currently a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives where she has been a leader on clean energy issues. Before being elected to the Ma Massachusetts legislature, Ms. Robinson spent 10 years working on wholesale electricity market regulatory issues and energy efficiency and renewable energy issues in the private sector. I look forward to hearing about the views, experience, and perspective that she would bring to the Office of Electricity. Dr. D. Carolus, our final nominee, who has been nominated to be the Administrator of the Energy Information Administration. EIA collects, analyzes, and publishes the energy data that the Department of Energy, other federal agencies, and Congress depend on to shape nations, the nation's energy policies. The administrator is responsible for collecting and analyzing energy information and forecasting future trends, but also preserving EIA's political independence and its professional integrity. Dr. D. Carolus has been a professor at North Carolina State University for the past 14 years, where he has focused on developing and applying energy system models. I want to thank all three for being with us this morning and their willingness to accept these important positions. At this point, I'm going to recognize Senator Murkowski, who is filling in for Senator Brasso for her opening statement. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be back at the table with you. And uh, I want to thank the ranking member, Barrasso, um, who asked me to cover for him this morning. As you mentioned, we're here to consider Ms. Maria Robinson to be Assistant Secretary of Energy for the Office of Electricity, Mr. Joseph De Carolis. De Carlos. De Carlos. De Carlos. Okay, we're going to get it right here. Um, Mr. De Carlos to be administrator of the Energy Information Administration, and Ms. Laura Daniel Davis to be assistant secretary of the Interior for Land and Minerals Management. I welcome all three of you 
to the committee. Ms. Robinson, I look forward to hearing how you plan to help modernize the nation's electric grid, how you plan to help enhance its security and reliability, and how you will help facilitate recovery from potential disruptions in energy supply. Especially, we'll be looking for you to demonstrate your understanding of my state, which leads the world in microgrids, but has limited big grids, if you will, but a genuine need for assistance to help us lower electricity costs. Mr. D. Carolis, you should know that I am one who cares about the EIA. Um, as I have chaired this committee over the years, I look forward to the review every year. Um, you are a, uh, an, an agency, an entity that we rely on, but we rely on you for nonpartisan information. I appreciate that in your testimony you highlighted EIA's legal obligation to operate independently of the administration's policy positions and I look forward to hearing more about your plans for the agency. Ms. Daniel Davis, you are nominated for a position that is of great significance to, to my home state of Alaska. As the chairman has noted, I think all the members on the committee have, have interest in this position um, because of the very, very, very wide portfolio that you have. As you know, in Alaska, we have more federal land than any other state. Um, some can see that as a blessing, others may see it as a curse, but we, we need the department to be our partner, not our landlord. But that relationship has really taken a turn, um, I think a turn in the wrong direction in, in the year plus that this administration has been in office. The last individual named to this position as Assistant Secretary was a fellow by the name of Joe Balash, who was a friend of mine, fellow Alaskan, and when he departed this role, and when that last administration ended, I would argue that the department's policies toward Alaska were finally in a good place, or certainly a better place than they had been. Numerous Alaska projects were either approved or headed in the right direction. Our vastly outdated public land orders were being lifted. We were no longer being treated as one giant park or wildlife refuge. But unfortunately, it didn't take very long for this administration to knock much of that off track. We've seen action after action, decision after decision, go against reasonable land access and resource production in Alaska. For oil and gas, for mining, for just about everything that we have and responsibly want to produce, whether it's up in the NPRA or over in the 1002 area or other parts of the state. And as a state that entered the union with an agreement that resource production is how we would sustain ourselves and reach our potential, it's pretty tough. It's just pretty tough. It's worse than a simple broken promise. It's a broken statehood agreement. And believe me, people in Alaska discuss it just that way. And it's hard on everyone. The consequences of the administration's resource policies are clearer by the day. Commodity prices are way up, and so is inflation, causing pain for families and businesses. Our geopolitical leverage is down, which is what happens when keep it in the ground prevails over the use of our energy as a strategic and a diplomatic asset. Others are certainly happy to fill our void, that's no surprise, but they can't replace the United States as the world's swing producer. Nor is there any excuse for an administration that decides to go to OPEC for more oil and gas and to Canada and others for minerals while leaving our best domestic projects stalled out. We know that an energy transition is underway. But we also know that it's not going to be an overnight shift. The country, the world, are going to need our tra traditional resources for a long time to come. And meanwhile, demand for minerals from projects like, like those that could be located in the Ambler Mining District, the, the, the demand is only going up and dramatically so. We need an administration that recognizes those facts and plans their policies accordingly. We should do everything that we can to advance clean and renewable technologies, and we need to do more of it yesterday. But that can't be paired with a fundamental incoherence on traditional energy and mining. And so our job is to make sure the Secretary of the Interior has a team that will facilitate the safe, responsible production of our domestic resources, certainly including Alaska. So I look forward to the question and answer section of this, this hearing and the decisions that are being made in or, or really against my home state. So I look forward to the discussions, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the rules of the committee, which apply to all nominees, require that they be sworn in in connection with their testimony. So if you all would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give to the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. 
You may be seated. Before you begin your statement, I will ask three questions addressed to each nominee before this committee. Number one, will you be available to appear before the committee and other congressional committees to represent departmental uh, positions and respond to issues of concern to the Congress? Yes. Are you aware of any personal holdings, investments, or interests that can constitute a conflict of interest or create the appearance of such a conflict should you be confirmed and assume the office to which you have been nominated by the president? Note all three. Finally, are you involved or do you have any assets held in a blind trust? No. So let's, let us begin with, uh, with Ms. Robinson. Uh, you're recognized to make your statement, so please proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman Manchin um, and uh, Senator Murkowski. It's wonderful to be here. Um, Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to testify in front of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. I'm honored to be nominated by President Biden to serve as the Assistant Secretary of Energy for the Office of Electricity. And I'm humbled to have the opportunity to work with Secretary Granholm in the Department of Energy. Having myself grown up in a small former coal mining town near Scranton, I share the President's concern that we need to provide reliable, secure, affordable, and clean energy to Americans while also creating good-paying un good union jobs. My background working in both the public and private sector on electricity issues provides me with a unique perspective and tools to meet the Department's mission and goals. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge my family and friends for their ongoing support throughout my career. My gratitude knows no bounds for my parents, uh, whose hard work and unending support provided me with the freedom to pursue my dreams. My loving husband, who gracefully provides our family with wonderful stability, and my brilliant 13-year-old daughter, who keeps me very grounded with reminders that I am a public servant, and therefore she is technically my boss. My focus on energy and electricity policy emerged from an initial technological interest as an undergraduate studying chemical engineering at MIT. But I found a true passion for being at the nexus of technology and policy. My time at Navigant Consulting allowed me to work directly with state and local governments, utilities, independent power producers, and major corporations on strategy and implementation programs to strengthen generation, transmission, and distribution across the nation's grid. Through this work, I traveled with electricians and contractors to distribute energy resources sites and received firsthand lessons in the need to update our grid infrastructure to accommodate higher demand at sources ranging from Logan Airport to rural water treatment plants. We continue to see this need for additional deployment, working with states and utilities to build new transmission assets and upgrade aging grid infrastructure using the funding provided for in the bipartisan infrastructure law. In leading a National Trade Association's wholesale market policy and wearing multiple hats in state policy and market analysis, I had the opportunity to work with state utility commissioners, state legislatures, air and energy offices, trade associations, and national groups in the energy sector, such as NASIO and NARUC, as well as directly with utilities, both investor-owned and public power and electric co-ops. All of these constituencies will play a key role in ensuring transmission and distribution projects are built in optimal locations with minimal roadblocks. Part of the work must be done in research and development, taking existing technologies and finding ways to scale them for widespread use, uh, such as the department's long duration storage energy earthshot. During my time at Advanced Energy Economy, I had the privilege of working with businesses and utilities who are working in generation, transmission, software, efficiency, smart grid, and much more, all of whom will play a critical role in building and operating a 21st century electric grid. I believe in America's ability to solve problems through technological development with smart investments and well-designed policies. This includes achieving the Biden administration's goals <coughs> of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 and maintaining a reliable, resilient grid that can withstand the ever-increasing amount of catastrophic weather-induced events. With new discoveries being made at rapid fire pace across the power industry, I want to ensure that we're meeting the moment with flexible policies that can adapt to new advancements <laughs> in technology. This is especially true for cybersecurity policy that can manage the delicate balance between security, affordability, and feasibility while accounting for technological changes in both hardware and software. I currently sit on the Advanced IT, Internet, and Cybersecurity Committee at the state legislative level. And policymakers across the country are grappling with the reality that we could see catastrophic failures without the right precautions. 
it is incumbent upon the department to work with experts in cybersecurity to develop and implement technologies and policies that make our grid more secure. I know it's a priority of the secretary and if confirmed, would be a priority of mine uh, that cybersecurity is considered in all parts of the work that we do. Again, I thank you, Chairman Manchin, Senator Murkowski, and all, all the members of the committee that are here today for your time. Um, should I be confirmed, I hope that this is the beginning of a strong partnership between all of your offices and the Office of Electricity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. I'm so sorry. If you would love to introduce your family, we'd love to. My, um, <laughs> Is your family here with you? My family's not here. I have uh, two friends and colleagues okay. uh, here with me today uh, as support. Okay. I'm grateful then. Now we're going to hear from Mr. Carlos. And if you have any of your family members here, would you like to introduce? Sure. Uh, so my wife, Chrissy, my uh, daughter, Katie, and my son, Nicholas. Oh, great. Yeah, two out of the, my three kids here today. Great to have them with us. Thank you. Please. Uh, Chairman Manchin, uh, Ranking Member Barrasso, Senator Murkowski, distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor and a privilege to appear before you today as the nominee for Administrator of the Energy Information Administration. I'm grateful to President Biden and Secretary Granholm for trusting me with this important role. I also want to thank my family, especially my wife Christine, for their support. I am deeply honored by the opportunity to lead EIA. EIA collects, curates, analyzes, and disseminates data pertaining to all aspects of the U.S. energy system. As the federal statistical agency within the Department of Energy, the value of EIA's work is difficult to overstate. If you were to pick at random a news item or research study focused on the U.S. energy system, it very likely includes a reference to EIA data. EIA products underpin our collective understanding of the U.S. energy system, and are a source of sound, unbiased data and analysis for decision makers in both the public and private sectors. I want to underscore EIA's legal obligation to operate independently of policy positions taken within the federal government. EIA's independence and impartiality make it a trusted and reliable source of information on highly complex energy issues. If confirmed, my highest priority will be to maintain EIA's well-deserved reputation for impartiality. My academic career as an engineer and energy systems modeler aligns well with the analytical mission of EIA. After double majoring in physics and environmental science and policy at Clark University, I obtained a PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University. My PhD research taught me to analyze complex energy issues at the intersection of engineering, economics, and public policy. After graduation, I joined the Environmental Protection Agency where I developed expertise in energy systems modeling. Over time, it became clear to me that the prevailing approach to modeling within the international community was flawed. First, the models were opaque to outsiders. If models were cars, it was impossible to look under the hood and kick the tires. Second, modelers needed to do a better job quantifying future uncertainty and how it might affect the model projections. Making models public and addressing future uncertainty not only makes modeling more scientific, but it fulfills a moral imperative to inform stakeholders, decision makers, and the general public on issues that affect everyone's lives. Improving the energy modeling process became my overarching focus when I began my faculty position at NC State University in 2008, a position I still hold today. Over the last decade, I've helped to lead the development of next generation energy system modeling tools that are open source, transparent, and designed to deliver policy relevant insights. If I have the privilege of being confirmed, I would like to pursue several priorities that will enhance EIA's ability to fulfill its mission in the 21st century. These priorities are grounded in my experience as a consumer of EIA products over the last 20 plus years in mirror priorities that are highlighted in the bipartisan infrastructure law. First, EIA should strive to make its products more accessible and transparent. This includes making EIA models open source and integrating different data streams into real-time online dashboards. Transparency and accessibility engender trust, foster understanding, and allow stakeholders to make better use of EIA products. Second, EIA's modeling capability should be expanded to examine a wider range of future scenarios that include the full spectrum of available fuels and technologies. 
The model should be tested under a wider range of assumptions to better evaluate potential outcomes pertaining to cost, emissions, reliability, and security. As part of this effort, EIA also needs to engage in cross-agency coordination on emerging issues in the energy economy, like the demand for critical minerals. Third, EIA data and analysis can provide additional insight into energy trends and the resulting impact on communities, including the accessibility and reliability of energy supply and the effect of price changes on energy poverty. I'm thrilled by the opportunity to lead the Energy Information Administration. As a country, we face many critical energy, uh, energy challenges over the next several decades, and EIA will play a critical role in that ongoing discussion. If confirmed, I look forward to working with Congress on a nonpartisan basis to advance our collective understanding of our past, present, and future energy system. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Finally, we have Mr. Daniel Davis. And Ms. Davis, I might say, you, we have your previous statement on record. Any additional comments you want to make, you're more than free to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and good morning, and good morning, Senator Murkowski and members of the committee. Um, it is, again, an honor to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee to be the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management at the Department of the Interior, um, and I'm grateful uh, that my husband, Mark, uh, can appear with me again today. He's back behind me. He's hanging right in there, huh? Yes. <laughs> um, so the Department Department, and I'll just offer a few remarks. Uh, the Department of the Interior has been one of the most significant and formative influences on my life. Uh, the leadership positions that I have held there uh, and in other organizations have given me knowledge of the public lands, the energy programs, both onshore and offshore, that the department manages and a deep understanding of the department's operations and broad mission, which touches so many people's lives in very real ways every day. And that's true whether we live in the West or another part of our great country. Uh, over the course of my career, I have had the privilege of working with and learning from so many significant mentors, um, including former and current secretaries, um, and former Congressman and Senator Mark Udall. These lessons were meaningful and they are still with me of the importance of government service and that it is the people, not yourself, that you serve, of the value of collaboration to ensure that we're leading with equity and fairness and that we should strive for a bipartisan spirit to accomplish goals that are so important to our country's future. I deeply value and appreciate the role that the department's bureaus serve in accomplishing its mission activities, including those that fall under the jurisdiction for the position for which I've been nominated. The Bureau of Land Management's multiple use mission makes it uniquely important for resource development, for recreation, and to provide economic opportunities to working families as it manages the vast federal acreage under its jurisdiction. Offshore, the important work of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement to responsibly and safely develop energy resources on the Outer Continental Shelf helps assure our country's energy independence and is critical to our energy future. And the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement provides crucial support to coal communities for reclamation of former mining lands and economic development opportunities, making sure that states have the tools to oversee their transitioning programs. These bureaus uh, will, of course, be fundamental to the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, which was supported by many of you and has passed since I last appeared. We're so appreciative of the bipartisan support and for the opportunity to work with you to improve our country's infrastructure and to improve people's lives. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Secretary Holland had the opportunity to announce additional funding that will be provided this year uh, to address abandoned mine land reclamation in communities across the country. Uh, I know that you, Mr. Chairman, worked tirelessly uh, to uh, extend the AML program and uh, to ensure and secure that the supplemental funding would be available. Um, and these resources are going to allow communities to do more to put more people to work in well-paying, family-supporting jobs to accelerate this vital reclamation 
and restoration work and support local economies. Um, last week, uh, Secretary Holland announced the first tranche of formula funding for states to begin addressing the capping and restoration of orphan oil and gas wells. And these resources, too, uh, will provide jobs and economic support for hundreds of impacted communities, historic investments to clean up these areas um, and ensure that we catalyze economic growth and revitalization and reduce harmful methane leaks. Um, my time in Interior has also taught me the fundamental role that the department's career employees serve. Their hard work and expertise help us accomplish so much, well, everything, really, uh, across the department's bureaus and programs. If confirmed, I will work hard to support the bureaus as they implement their programs and address the important infrastructure needs of society. I commit to tirelessly working to better understand how I can help best, best help them uh, be successful in their missions and for the American public. I look forward to working in a respectful and collaborative fashion with this committee, with states, tribes, and program stakeholders to address the shared challenges that we face um, Thank you again for having me, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, and thank all three of you for your for your uh, pr presentation. Uh, I'll start the questioning, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Andrew Davis, I'll start with you. You know, during the previous administration, the department tried to lease probably as much as it could, as fast as it could, and under the current administration, they came in and hit the pause button, and we were supposed to get a report back after we evaluated our, our process and our leasing and how we did it. Uh, but then the courts intervened, uh, and, and Louisiana said you had to start leasing again. And then two weeks ago, another court here in town found the offshore lease sale you held last November, which is the largest in history, to be unlawful and struck down the sale. So we're back to square one now. So my question would be, can you explain the department's leasing program onshore, offshore, and where it stands at this point? Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman, and um, I think just confirming um, that we you know, are in compliance uh, with the court ruling you referenced, uh, Louisiana v. Biden, and moving forward with the leasing program onshore and offshore. Um, I, I think at a very um, high level, what you are describing w uh, with regard to um, you know, sort of lit litigation activities and outcomes um, really um, inspires me to continue to work um, you know, with the secretary, um, with the teams that we lead to ensure that we are um, taking the law seriously, taking processes seriously, um, taking the time to um, uh, seek uh, and, and, and reflect upon public input. We receive uh, understanding uh, where uh, the, the requests are to, to cite uh, energy activity and any important conflicts uh, that may be found there. And of course, um, I, I just, I will reflect that what, um, you know, the concern with the, these, these rulings, of course, is that in many cases, they um, are, are finding that the process was not completely followed and, and indeed, Let in me some follow cases, up shortcut. Then. I think yes, I sir. can follow up with another question mm -hmm. with you. You're, you're familiar with the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Yes, sir. Okay. And what it's been going through. And I think it, out of 300 plus miles, there's 24 miles left. That's it. And it's in your valley wick to a certain extent. Um, it keeps running into court cases after court cases after court cases. The product needs to get to market. The market desperately needs the energy we're producing uh, from the natural gas production, the Marcellus cell and Utica shell. Uh, but we're having a hard time. We're going, you know, I keep fearing we're going to end up like Europe and, 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 and a crunch. And right now, it's hard for me to go to West Virginia and explain why we're asking other countries to produce energy for us. And we've been energy independent for so long. And we've been able to hit that milestone, and now we're back to where we are depending on other, other uh, production. So uh, how quickly will the BLM, um, which you oversee, correct their issue and its permits? And the reason I say that, <clears throat> they're saying that they threw out several environmental reviews uh, and relate for the pipeline and stopped the projects. They were thrown out not through any fault of the applicant, but because the judge ruled that the agencies didn't include enough information in their reviews. So uh, it, it, to my standpoint, you know, these people said they jumped through every hoop you put there, and then all of a sudden the court throws it out because you all, your review process or what you told them to do wasn't accurate enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a, a great question. I know um, that this is an issue of importance to you. Um, you know, well, the whole East Coast. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, the 
at, at our uh, department, the solicitor's office and BLM are kind of the leads in looking at this very um, recent uh, litigation rulings. Um, I, um, you know, will agree with you that um, the uh, had, this is the second time it's been sent back, and you know, deficiencies in the review um, of uh, the federal entities has been identified as the issue. So um, we are working closely, uh, you know, with our uh, with our solicitor's office. You know, Forest Service, as you know, has a role as well in this, um, as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's sort of uh, across my agency and and, and one other, and uh, understanding that um, this was a, a, a permit that was provided uh, really at the tail end of the previous administration, and it, it, it's, it's well, I'd possible. like to spend more time with you so we can correct this, and basically the agency should have more input, basically knowing what the courts are going to be asking for, because they're giving us pretty clear direction. Ms. Robinson, if I could very quickly just follow up with you, and then my time will be out. I'm aware of your past roles. I'm thinking specifically about your role uh, for advanced energy to economy, that you've been an advocate of renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency over more traditional generation technologies like the fossil industry that we have, whether it be coal, natural gas, things of that sort. I'm concerned about the reliability. I see what Europe's going through. I'm all for the clean energy. I'm all for doing what we do cleaner. I've always said this, you cannot eliminate your way to a cleaner environment, but you can sure innovate your way to it. But if you're, just, if you're moving on elimination, we're not going to be able to have the energy this country needs. That scares me. And I just want to know where you stand on uh, the focus on advancing the reliable and making sure reliable is at the foremost front of what we do and not just the desires of some that might not carry the load as we know. Thank you, Senator. I'll try and talk quickly and appreciate that and appreciate your concern for reliability. I believe that for the Office of Electricity, reliability is the number one concern and will be my number one concern for maintaining. I think there are lots of things that we need to do in order to do that, including grid uh, capability upgrades, which a lot of uh, which will come through the bipartisan infrastructure bill. I certainly see a role for firm dispatchable power well into the future and love to continue having more conversations with you about that. Right. And also, if you think about, you know, we, we need to get transmission in into the areas where our clean energy can be deployed. Correct. How are you planning on getting through as far as basically getting the, the siting done? I mean, that's been a challenge. Uh, these the transmission lines into where the large uh, solar panels are going to be or where the large wind farms are going to be is going to be challenging to get to market. Do you all have a plan or do you, have you thought about that, how you would be able to accelerate the transmission to carry the power to the market? Certainly, and there's funding in the bipartisan infrastructure bill that would allow for a, a greater build out. There's obviously the siting and permitting issues, but there are also additional authorities in the bipartisan infrastructure bill that will allow for greater collaboration with states and municipalities. Are you saying that we can share revenue or pay, re pay, pay these states and localities that aren't so keen on having a new transmission line coming through their state? I think. Senator, I think that's probably a conversation to be had with FERC and, and their cost allocation and, and sharing, but happy to continue. The I think we need to find a way that we can get this uh, new power to market. Senator Murkowski. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, Daniel Davies, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to try to focus on these issues that have come up since the last time you were before the committee, um, as I had a a chance to go into some detail there. I'm going to start by just acknowledging what you've noted in your opening statement and offer thanks. Um, I appreciate the announcement last week that uh, from the department about moving forward with the orphaned well program. Um, we're going to be getting uh, $32 million in the, in the state of Alaska, and that's going to help us with this cleanup effort that has been going on for a long time, but also help with the jobs, so we appreciate that. Um, I am pleased that the administration is continuing to support the Willow Project. I have made it very, very clear to anybody who's willing to listen from the president on down that Willow is, is absolutely key um, when we think about uh, Alaska's production uh, capacity going forward. Um, but I also recognize that as we're moving forward, we've got some very, very, very tight windows, some narrow construction windows for this year. I'd like your commitment that the department will finish a supplemental EIS that addresses the court's concerns by the end of this first quarter. 
Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. And um, it, it, I, we are, we're pleased to move forward even last week. I'm sure you, you saw with a, an informal scoping period with regard to um, informing our preparation of the, the supplemental EIS. I believe that our schedule has us uh, ready to have a draft uh, out in the public for comment during the second quarter. Well, I, I'm going to urge you, as I have others, that, uh, again, dragging this or extending too long results in real consequences on the ground because, again, we don't have 365 days a year within which to, to move forward with these projects. So I'm just going to to urge urge the department to act as expeditiously as possible on this. Um, initially, I think folks were looking at that first quarter, so it's very frustrating to hear that it could slip into the second. So I'm just going to urge again, um, expediency, efficiency, and, and a real recognition as to the urgency there. Um, let me switch now to, to the Ambler Access Project, because I have a lot of Alaskans that are in town this week. They're going to be knocking on doors at the uh, department. They're, they're speaking here. But this is a project that uh, we have been engaged with for some time. As you know, it was initiated back in 2015 while you were at the department with the Obama administration. It's supported by, by many local Alaska Native communities, the Northwest Arctic Borough, the Nana Regional Corporation. There has been a, a very, very lengthy record of public meetings, of the hearings, of the consultations, um, and yet a 90-day public comment period that was extended to a total of 330 days. Uh, the FEIS joint record of decision cost taxpayers nearly $5 million to complete, and, and now the department is, is requesting a 60-day stay and then another 30-day stay to allow for additional consultation. I'm going through my, my homework last night. This is a packet that uh, was sent to me by uh, Ada, who is involved in this project, just outlining the various consultation that has gone on recently. Uh, the, uh, the additional thing that was in my home pack was a letter from our governor, again, um, asking uh, uh, the deputy secretary to, to please move forward, recognizing the level of consultation that has been underway. So I, I guess the question that Alaskans are asking me is, if they need more consultation, what have they been doing with this consultation period um, in this 60-day in this stay? So can you share with me who the, the department actually consulted with during this period? Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of record out there from Ada that shows me who has been involved with consultation. I don't know if you have uh, a similar document that you can share, but they're saying if if all this consultation has gone on, why why is an additional 30 day stay now required? So appreciate that question, and um, we this is a project on, on which we have um, you know heard from a lot of different organizations uh, with regard to the consultation activity, um, and I understand what what you're saying, Senator, uh, about the. Um, you know, the record that you're looking at. I think what we've heard directly from some tribes, and I, I don't have a list in front of me, but I would be, be, be pleased to, to go back and, and consult with the department. But what we've heard would, is they... I think it would be important for us mm -hmm. to, to just understand, because again, we're, we're looking around and asking the question, who has not yet been consulted, given the, the very voluminous record that has been created to date? So the question, when you say you need additional time for consultation, who? Um, well, so I, again, I, the, the undertaking formal consultation, and again, we, we heard that some tribes did, did not uh, believe that they had been properly formally consulted in the, in the development uh, of the record. Um, moreover, uh, we heard uh, about significant subsistence concerns, and that those are the, the, the conversations and the consultations that have been ongoing. I, I want to hasten to add that we are, of course, open to um, meeting and have been meeting, I think, the Deputy Secretary in particular with a number of, of the other organizations that you mentioned. Apparently, my time is expired, and Senator Heinrich, Senator Heinrich you are up. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, 
Daniel Davis, last month in New Mexico, there was a reprehensible criminal attack on petroglyphs on public land at La Cienega site uh, near Santa Fe. Uh, someone defaced images that had been left there by ancient Puebloan centuries, if not millennia ago. The damage that was done, um, to some degree, some of it may be irreversible. It may never be able to be undone. But we can work to make sure that people who desecrate sacred spaces on public lands are held accountable and to prevent those kinds of attacks in the future. So I wanted to ask, in particular, what is, what is BLM doing to investigate this particular crime? And then how seriously is the BLM taking the protection of cultural sites on the Caja del Rio Plateau writ large? Thanks, Senator. And this this criminal desecration is 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 um, unacceptable and you know unbelievably sad. Um, and it's a top priority for the Bureau of Land Management to to figure out what happened and and to to bring the criminals to justice. Um, the BLM agents and rangers are working uh, directly with the FBI, uh, with the uh, Santa Fe County. Sheriff's Office in this matter. There's been a lot of outreach to um, local groups uh, to see if there's any information um, about who might have been in that area when this happened. And um, moreover, you know, the, the Taos BLM office has recently hired uh, a new uh, a law enforcement ranger to increase patrols, you know, here and elsewhere. Um, I mean, I do think that, you know, the, the support in the FY22 budget, and I know you're all working very hard on that, to support the BLM and the rebuilding of the BLM can only help um, in terms of these law enforcement challenges out on a very wide and important landscape. What portion of the BLM's budget goes to law enforcement? Senator, that is a great question, and I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I'm Let's happy to Let's find that out, you. because yes, my... my Experience having been an outfitter guide is it's not enough. It is is rare to see law enforcement out on the ground on public lands, and that that problem goes beyond the BLM. It applies to the the Forest Service and the Park Service as well. But I think in particular Interior, um, New Mexico is home to two of the newest national monuments: the Rio Grande del Norte Monument in Taos County, which you are intimately familiar with, and the Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks National Monument near Las Cruces. Um, however, even though it's been nearly a decade since these were designated, neither monument has ever had a finalized monument management plan. Uh, what's the status of the planning process for, for both of these, and can the Taos and Las Cruces communities expect, when can they expect those plans to be finished? So, Senator, we are, or the BLM is very focused on the planning process for both of these. I think it's not as far along as, as any of us would want, and um, I know that they are working to determine what a timeline is that will allow them to, you know, kind of tackle this and, and get it done. Again, I, I just, I have to reflect that the, um, you know, the, the, previous reorganization of the BLM in which they lost over, over 300 employees and the need to, to sort of uh, build back and um, it has, has certainly um, um, had an impact on this. But I, I just, I really want to assure you, Senator, it's, it's a high priority. BLM is um, very proud of these areas and wants to be sure that they have a functioning plan. Uh, Ms. Uh, Robinson, I want to ask you about our, our high voltage grid, our transmission bid, grid in particular. Um, you know, much of it's based on technology, I should say maybe equipment rather than technology that is 70 years old. Um, what can DOE and the Congress do to incentivize more rapid implementation of some of the grid technologies that we are seeing implemented very successfully around the world uh, that can give us more uh, transmission capacity in the short run in addition to building new transmission? So things like power flow controls, uh, dynamic line rating uh, with real-time sensors and management, reconductoring of existing transmission. How It seems like the, the financial models that many of our utilities work on don't incentivize those technologies because they're not big, expensive projects that can be rate-based. How can we get those uh, technologies out in, onto the grid faster? 
Thank you so much, Senator. And I, I share your concern about getting those smart grid technologies out onto the grid. Um, you may have seen PNNL just released a, a great report about transactive power, which is using a lot of those same technologies in the potential $50 billion in savings to consumers uh, if we're able to do that across the entire nation's grid. So certainly that creates a wonderful starting point as well as INL's grid test bed uh, to put put those to test right away. Um, looking forward to working through the Smart Grid um, integration program and the funding through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill as well to continue uh, quick deployment of, of all these technologies. But certainly there's a ton of efficiencies that we can utilize now to get um, in an in increasing amount of capacity on our existing infrastructure. Yeah, I would just leave you with the idea that um, we don't need more pilot projects. These things have been tested and tested and tested. Uh, we need a better grid. So um, hope you're up to the task. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next on the Republican side is Senator Lee, but I'm not sure if he is on. Are you online, Senator? If Senator Lee is not, then Senator Lankford is next up. And your timing is brilliant. Because I'm obviously stepping in right in the middle of the the first question on it. So, y'all, thank you. Thanks for going through the process. It's not a fun process to be able to go through, and uh, some of you have been through this for quite a while. Uh, so, I appreciate your engagement to be able to serve the country on it. I do have several questions just about how do we deal with energy long term and how do we resolve some of this. Uh, so, let, let me begin with Ms. Robinson. Um, let me just pick a day. January the 16th of this year, New England. 24% of their power was coming from home heating oil. Now, I think we would agree that natural gas is cleaner than home heating oil, but you've been very strong in your opposition to natural gas pipelines coming through and have pushed continually for renewables to try to be the long-term substitute. If I take that same day, January the 16th of this year, 24% of the power to New England was from home heating oil. 8% of that was actually coming from renewables on that same day. And if I take just what you talked about with solar and wind, that's about 30% of that 8%. So it's a really tiny fraction that's actually coming there. So what I'm trying to figure out is just directionally, I understand where directionally you're looking to be able to go somewhere else on this, but in reality of what we're actually facing right now, we literally have at times Russian tankers coming to be able to bring in natural gas to New England instead of getting American because we can't get pipelines to that area and the people of New England are facing higher prices and you've been very outspoken in support of that. So I'm just trying to get the balance of where we're going on some of these things. Thank you, Senator Langford, sure. and, and appreciate the concern about prices. I am a Massachusetts representative and I get phone calls about the prices of energy all the time um, from folks. So one of the things that I wanna be very sensitive about in coming uh, into this role, if confirmed, is to consider what regional uh, organizations and states want to see long-term. I, I have worked for a long time in state policy. I'm currently in, in um, the state legislature. And I want to be considerate of the fact that the long-term goals of New England are moving in, in the general direction, as you said, towards decarbonization. Now, if you look at the interconnection queue in ISO New England, where, where I'm sure you got that delightful graph with the 24% of oil, um, the vast majority of oncoming uh, projects in the interconnection queue are renewable projects, but they've been stalled for a long period of time, in large part due to lack of integrated long-term transmission planning across the entire country, which is something that the department intends on doing as part of the Building Better Grid initiative that was announced a couple weeks ago. And that's gonna make um, a big difference to allow uh, some of these projects that have been stuck in the queue for a long time because we do want American-made uh, energy here. So is that the assumption then that wind and solar power will be created somewhere else in the country and then just brought to New England? So these are projects that are actually in located in New England um, that would that are waiting to be interconnected. A ton of solar in particular is is waiting to be interconnected into the queue that is located across um, across the six New England states. So um, in addition to the larger planning, of course, where we are looking at very wind um, wind heavy states such as yours, of course, right. where where we want to make sure that we are. Um, 
moving those resources to large sources of demand uh, moving forward, such as such as cities, um, there's going to be a, a really strong element of planning. And, and part of that is making the grid a lot smarter through this. Um, and so it can understand where it needs all, all the interchanges. So your assumption is in future days, then New England will have more solar power, but where there's been a significant amount of pushback on offshore wind to say, we don't want to see offshore wind here, we'll do it in Oklahoma and then just bring power to it so New England doesn't have to look at it. We do. So uh, th thank you for, for bringing up sort of those regional differences as well. Um, and I'd say that offshore wind is, if you ask Governor Baker, if you ask uh, Governor McKee, Offshore wind is a big part of the long-term plans for New England. Obviously, it's facing some hurdles throughout that process, um, but it is not just relying on offshore wind. It's also looking at other firm dispatchable power sources, such as um, energy storage, which I think is also going to be a major component of any sort of right. uh, grid resource. expect energy storage to be on board to be able to handle cities' capacity with mixing with renewables in the next 25 years? Senator, you run Boston I, with energy storage and wind and solar in 25 years, you think? So, Senator, I think we are seeing a larger transition towards clean energy in large part, not just in the generation sector, but we're also seeing it on the demand side. Um, right, Going back to demand response being a, a significant part of this yeah. work, but also uh, resources like electric vehicles, which are, are shown to provide grid benefits of vehicle to grid work. Um, and adding additional storage as that market continues to grow. I, I appreciate it. I'm, I, I apologize for running out of time on this. Th this is a larger conversation. Obviously, I've, I've got questions for all three of you. I'm not going to have time for to be able to go through. My bigger issue is just uh, the practicality of what's actually going on on the ground right now. If I take that just that one day I was mentioning before, over 50% of the energy of New England was in natural gas and oil that day and 8% renewables in the next 25 years, we're not going to have 50% of the renewables based on where we're going at this point and what's happening in the grid. And I'm just trying to figure out what, what happens now for consumers and how do we actually deal with prices as we continue to be able to look towards the future and where we are. And I want to make sure that we're balancing both on this, whether it be leasing issues where we don't have a leasing plan now for five years uh, for offshore and don't know what's going to happen on prices on that uh, because there doesn't seem to be a plan or whether it's day-to-day -day operations. So thank you. I apologize. Going a minute over. Senator Cortez Masto, by WebEx. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me just say to the nominees, um, congratulations, um, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, um, Ms. Laura Daniel Davis, let me, let me start with you. I'm going to talk a little bit about a challenge and an issue that we deal with in Nevada every day. And, and let me couch this by saying over 80% of the land is owned by the federal government. 6% of that is BLM managed. And then we also have the Nevada National Security Site, which the Department of Energy plays a key role. And, and, and so I know that the U.S. imports more than half of its annual consumption of 31 of the 35 critical minerals. And the U.S. is completely dependent on imports to supply its demand for 14 of them. These are materials that are necessary uh, really for our electronic devices, for national defense applications, for renewable energy technologies. And the Biden administration through the Department of Energy has already been heavily investing in initiatives to increase the domestic critical mineral production and likewise has been heavily in investing in renewable energy deployment as we're talking about today. However, our public lands are key to facilitating this need. I also know at the same time the Biden administration has launched the America the Beautiful initiative uh, to place a substantial amount of land and water in to conservation. Again, our public lands will be at the forefront of this effort too. Uh, to many, it sounds as if these two interests are, are in direct opposition to each other. Uh, however, to me, it sounds like uh, a challenge we can meet if we bring together the right people to take a holistic look at our needs and our resources and plan accordingly. I think that our, our lands uh, provide for us, but we also need to take proper care of them in return. There is a balance here that we can find. I also want to mention that Nevada has an incredible mining and it is known as a mining state as well. So, Ms. Daniel Davis, let me ask you, do you agree that you can find that balance, that these initiatives can coexist with one another? And how do you intend to reconcile these interests 
and work with differing stakeholders to balance to make that balance to secure our public lands uh, and make sure they're managed in a proper way. But at the same time, as we lean into this innovation economy and this clean energy economy, how do we manage both of those? Senator, thanks so much for the question, and I, I absolutely agree um, that um, this is a, a balance that can be managed. Of course, multiple use is the heart of the Bureau of Land Management, um, and uh, certainly the, 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 the president um, supports responsible development of critical minerals. The secretary, I do, um, as well as um, you know, renewable deployment, which, as you know, is um, also very active in Nevada and you have some of the most uh, amazing conservation lands. So as a, as a process matter, I think, um, and I think the BLM does a good job of this in, in Nevada, is uh, being uh, sure that they are having conversations early uh, and often with all of the stakeholders, interests, uh, government officials, tribes, uh, only in that way and sort of, you know, doing the sit down um, with maps and, and understanding where the resources are and where folks' interests are, are you able to kind of de conflict um, uh, areas, um, you know, protect wildlife habitat, for example, but also ensure that you are able to move forward in a balanced fashion with, um, you know, all of the activity that you mentioned, which uh, we support, and you're right, Nevada ha has all of it, so you really have a, a bird's eye view of it. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, let me talk a little bit about cybersecurity in your written testimony. You touched on uh, your experiences on the Advanced IT, the Internet and Cybersecurity Committee, uh, in which you work with other policymakers across the country to combat 21st century challenges and cyber threats to our electric grid. And, and uh, you went on to state, and I quote, it is incumbent upon the department to work with experts in cybersecurity to develop and implement technologies and policies that make our grid more secure. So if confirmed, can you speak to some of the cyber aspects that you would prioritize? specifically as it relates to interagency and intergovernmental collaboration and coordination to keep our energy system secure and reliable. Thank you so much, Senator. I appreciate the focus on cybersecurity. I, I think it's something we're all very concerned about but talk about in a somewhat vague fashion from time to time. Um, I've participated in a number of zero-day tabletop exercises, and I think it's something that we need to continue to utilize those resources in order to better plan for potential attacks on the grid, recognizing that they can happen um, either on the OT or the IT side of things. And they obviously have very different um, outcomes and, and processes. You know, whether we are talking about utilities themselves and some of the resources that um, they own and operate, or even to some degree subcontractors, like we saw with the Colonial Pipeline issues, we need to ensure um, that all sorts of contractors and utilities that work on the grid are implementing some basic uh, cybersecurity hygiene, whether it is just two-factor authentication. Um, or regular password changing, um, recognizing that we want to avoid as many zero-day um, opportunities for hackers as possible. Thank you. Um, I notice my time is up, Mr. DeCarolis. I didn't get a chance to ask you a question. I will submit the rest of my questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Daniel Davis, the, the draft EIS um, from the Cook Inlet lease sale includes a no action alternative. Um, so the Department of Interior's analysis, its, it's new analysis proposes to withhold leases, uh, which I think is something that uh, we, we, we can see leading to decreased supplies of oil and gas, and in turn, an increase in energy prices, w which will decrease demand and result in lower emissions. Is the administration plan always to choose the lowest emission proposal from their analyses? So thank you very much, um, Senator, for that question. And I don't, I, I don't, um, th this is a, a, an EIS and a re review that's in process, so decisions haven't been made. There are alternatives uh, before the department, which uh, the BOEM has taken comment on and is evaluating. So, right. but, but, but the question is just, is that the plan? Is there a plan in place to always choose the lowest emission proposal? 
So I think that in, in all things, we're going to follow the law and undertake the process and develop fully the alternatives associated with any EIS, and there's no pre-decisional activity that we uh, undertake at the department. Okay, no. so you're aware of no policy that says we're always going to go with the lowest emission alternative? No. Okay. Um, has the agency considered uh, a, a maximum that it'd be willing to see energy prices reach before it would forego um, a, a, a non-action, a, a no-action alternative, or, or is that even a consideration? So I think what's really important to remember is that you know production has continued on public lands onshore and offshore has stayed steady. Uh, so uh, you know revenue has continued to be generated, as well as there are over 9,000 permits available on BLM lands and over 70% of OCS land is not being developed. So I think there, there's a lot of space there for production and development to continue over time. The, um, the Bureau of Land Management recently updated its web page. And in so doing, it, it, um, it indicated that it's going to slap a, a, a levy. It's going to impose a, an 18.75% royalty on oil and gas leases. Okay. Now, this is an increase in royalty of about 50%. That's, that's heavy. That's a heavy spike. I find this curious, given everything else that's going on. Right? What can you tell me about why the department's increasing oil and gas royalties and placing a moratorium on leasing, uh, even while the administration is scrambling to try to relieve prices at the pump by calling for oil to be released from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for OPEC to increase production and suggesting that oil companies simply aren't drilling as much as they should be. How is that consistent? So the, the leasing process is underway and, and continues onshore and offshore. And with regard to the posting you're referencing, that was, um, I, I, you, you may have missed uh, that BLM indicated publicly that that um, had been a, a, a draft, one of uh, many um, you know, variables under consideration that it is not, uh, decisions haven't been made. I, I think you know, since I've been here last, we, we Wait, did decisions issue decisions haven't our, been made on what? Uh, with regard to how to, uh, how to move forward uh, with, with leasing and what the variables will be associated with the BLM lease sales. And again, since I was last here, we issued our, our report at the end of November. You may have had the opportunity to, to, to review it, and it, and it um, you know, indicates, um, you know, recommendations associated with, you know, ensuring a fair return to the taxpayer and discouraging speculation and, you know, ensuring that we are assessing climate impacts. So I think um, it's unsurprising that you, you, you might see a, a draft again, which was a draft and was, uh, you know, posted in error that would be looking at it precisely those kinds of issues. Okay. Well, it was, it was posted nonetheless, and a lot of people, uh, you can understand would be concerned about that when it uh, comes through an official source. Now, the, the oil and gas leasing report um, is something that I believe you helped produce, and it's 18 pages long, in, including the cover sheet, but it somehow took 11 months to prepare. There appears to be, as far as I can tell, no real original analysis in it. It, it sort of resembles a, a, a copy, cut, and paste job uh, that uh, on some talking points that have been parroted for years. Can you tell us how the oil and gas report factors into the president's promise to, quote, ban new oil and gas permitting on public lands and waters? And that is a direct quote. So the uh, oil and gas report that we worked on and prepared and then, um, you know, released at the end of November, um, it, I, I agree with you. It is not uh, original work. And in, in fact, we were pleased actually to be able to look at, um, you know, literally decades of information that had been developed by the General Accounting Office, by our own Inspector General at Interior. Um, we, you know, held a, a public forum. Um, we had repeated meetings with, um, you know, folks across the spectrum from, you know, industry to conservation community to indigenous communities. We held formal tribal consultation. So again, I, I think that, and what we ended up doing was providing some recommendations associated with a leasing program that we think, um, you know, if um, those are undertaken, will will be a more fair program and and reflective of the issues that we put forward. I, I, I appreciate that. But I don't think you've answered my question. My question was, uh, 
whether it factors in the President's promise to ban new oil and gas permitting on public lands? So, I mean, I, I guess I'll just say again, the, the leasing process is underway uh, onshore and offshore, and the, the report as developed and released is provides specific recommendations associated with um, a leasing program. So that would suggest that he's, it does not do this. He's backing away from it? So I'm not... Um, in a position to, to speak for the president. I can just tell you what we're doing at the Department of the Interior. And again, that report was developed to provide specific recommendations for a program to ensure that it provided a better return to the taxpayer, was less speculative, particularly onshore, and uh, took uh, climate impacts into an uh, in account and made sh ensured that we were doing proper public um, review of uh, any leasing activity on public lands and waters. Thank you. Senator, Senator Rona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to all of you on your nominations and your willingness to serve. I asked the following two initial questions of every nominee to any of the, in any of the committees on which I sit. You can answer Amas. So the first question, since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No. Uh, no, for all of you. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? Yes. Thank you. I was uh, listening very carefully to the increase in royalties from um, our, our uh, oil and gas leases, and those have been traditionally very, very low. And I, for one, am glad that you are increasing the royalty amounts. That is a comment for, um, okay. <laughs> Ms. Daniel Davis. So all I can say is good. Okay. For Ms. Robinson, thank you for mentioning your really smart 13-year-old daughter. <laughs> I feel like she's gonna be running the world soon. Just make sure that public service is really important to her too, as it is to you. Uh, if confirmed, you will be responsible for overseeing the historic investments to modernize the power grid. Modernization of grids is, I think, an important issue for every single state, including, of course, the state of Hawaii, which has seven separate grids for each island, and it is a, uh, uh, it is a challenge for us to modernize that grid. But um, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the law provides $11 billion for states, tribes, and uh, utilities to improve the resilience of the grid against cyber attacks and the extreme uh, weather from climate change. It, it provides $3 billion for small grid grants, which make it easier for homes and businesses to use their own solar and storage systems. How would you... Um, ensure that the funds are spent well and on time so people see the benefits of affordable, reliable, and clean power. This is probably more of an investment in grid modernization ever, and we, we need to make sure that it is uh, spent well. So how would you go about to making sure of that? Sure, thank you so much, Senator. And Hawaii's been such a leader on all of the energy issues, um, somewhat out of necessity, I suppose, um, over, over the past decades. And recognizing that um, much like Alaska, you're not necessarily as invested in the high voltage uh, DC the way that other parts of the country are. So um, an increased investment in microgrids is going to be uh, uh, incredibly important as, as we're moving forward. And, and similarly, I, I might note um, that the department just made a, an announcement around work in Puerto Rico, uh, working with HUD and DHS, FEMA, uh, to develop a number of different tools that I think are applicable um, for both Hawaii and Alaska as well, including a, a great emergency management tool um, that will look at, at weather events and how to prevent outages uh, on, on the grid should they move forward. So I, I do look forward to working with you on that. With regards to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, you know, I'm not 
privy to internal deliberations uh, over at the Department of Energy now, but I know that that is a major focus of the Secretary to ensure that we are working, uh, sorry, the Department is working very closely with states, tribes, regions, and municipalities to uh, many of whom have long-term plans that they, they would love to see um, funded, but haven't had an opportunity to fund in the past. So uh, I look forward to working with you and other members of the committee uh, on getting those funds out the door. These are going to be very complex kinds of uh, issues and challenges because you were asked uh, questions about uh, why uh, there's a, such a small amount of uh, reliance on an alternative energy, I think, in the New, New England, Maine. And I just note that in November, voters in Maine rejected a $1 billion transmission project to bring hydropower from Quebec into New England. And the, the line could have reduced the reliance on fossil fuels and for power in New England. Mm -hmm. So these are very complicated issues. And for Hawaii, you know, the, I mean, we're not connected, uh, as are the, uh, the 48 states. And so the, the idea of uh, using power generated from one of our islands and having a transmission cap capacity to send that power to another island is uh, highly good. Well, th there are technical issues, but you know th there are all those kinds of community concerns about that kind of situation. I just, uh, well, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, for uh, Mr. Sure. De Carolus, uh, you, you noted the, that uh, that that you will be the federal statistical entity that we can rely on independently. But my understanding is that that your agency has not been terribly accurate in terms of how it's um, determining what the cost of solar energy may be, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I hope that you will be making the accurate assumptions and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and inputting the kinds of information that you need to provide us with much more accurate information than, you, I'm not blaming you, you're not there yet. Um, more accurate information for the communities. Thank you. Thank Senator you, Mr. Cassidy. Chairman. Yes, yes ma'am. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Daniel Davis, I'll be directing my questions to you. Um, and with the kind of prologue that we now have the highest inflation in 40 years, if we included the cost of energy, the inflation rate would not be 7 percent, it would be approaching 10 percent. Uh, Russia has leverage in the EU. We have higher energy prices here because this administration has kind of led an effort to limit production and development of North American resources. That we can say unequivocally. Indeed, we have Democratic senators who want to leave the EU high and dry and vulnerable to the Russians because they don't like the fact that natural gas is $4.30 per, or $3.79 per BCF, when that is the envy of the world. Um, We've gone from within a year being energy independent to groveling before OPEC to ask them to increase world supply because our gasoline prices have gone up so much. That is the so far legacy of this administration. Now, my questions, if you will, and it's a little long, the U.S. District of Court entered, ordered a preliminary injunction on the leasing pause and ordered federal oil and gas lease sales to proceed on June 15th, 2021. The, the DOI held lease sale 257 on November 17th to comply. But then on January the 27th of this year, the U.S. District Court for District of Columbia invalidated this, requiring DOI to reassess environmental impacts of lease sale 257. Now, has the Department of Interior started the process to comply with the January 27th court order so that lease sale 257 can be validated and leases awarded to offshore operators? And uh, what is the DOI's timeline for compliance with the court order and how soon can they meet the requirements so the leases can be awarded? And please keep your answers short. Thank you, Senator. And of course, we are looking at the decision. It's it's not yet two weeks old, and um, it, it did. I'm sure this was anticipated. So it would be a little naive to say that oh, it came out of the blue. So the the remand and vacature of the lease sale um, is sort of the where we're at, and what that requires is the department, um, you know, working together with our solicitor's office, of course, and having a lot of internal conversation about 
the process to cure the defects identified by this court. And so when do you intend to and when do we anticipate that being, one, do you intend to and when do we expect it to be accomplished? So again, I think we're at the, the, uh, the beginning um, and I understand that this is a very important question and it's important to us. So to currently there is yes. no timeline? There's no timeline. Okay, for that tells me a lot. The department, I'm sorry to be, I don't mean to be rude, but I mean, I just have a lot of questions and I'm a little frustrated, you might guess, as are the workers in my state who will not have jobs because of this deliberate foot dragging by the administration. The Department of Interior, second question, must issue a notice of sale for lease, uh, for the lease sale two, uh, 259 on March the 2nd, 2022, in order to comply with the June 15th ruling and provide, by the way, the U.S. with much needed benefits associated with the federal oil and gas leasing. Is DOI working on the notice of sale for lease sale 259? And when do you expect to issue this notice, assuming that you are? Is DOI expediting lease sale 259 to comply with the June 15th order and to hold it before the expiration of the 2017-2022 Outer Continental Shelf lease plan? So I am not going to be in a position to talk about deliberative activities and get ahead of the secretary. I can assure you that we're in compliance with the court, uh, the June ruling, and are moving forward with the lease program. Now, do, compliance now speaks of now. Is that to say that three weeks from now, you will still be in compliance, which is to say that the lease sale will be held by March 2nd? So I said, I'm just, I'm really not in a position to get ahead of the secretary's decision-making on a delivery. So you mean the secretary may decide not to do this? He may decide to defy the district court. That's what I'm hearing from you. So Secretary Holland has wide discretion in managing this program. Even if a court I'm is ordering her to do so? I'm not signaling anything about the secretary's decision-making other than we are in a deliberative posture and I'm not going to get ahead of her here. Let me ask another. The 2016 Obama administration study conducted by Bohm concluded that America's greenhouse gas emissions will be little affected by leasing decisions on Bohm's offshore leasing program. Indeed, could result, if we don't lease, an increase because the emissions associated with importing foreign oil are greater than domestic production. Now, by the way, I represent those workers who will be on those rigs, so it's also about jobs here versus jobs elsewhere in the world. Um, so does DOI, this more effective moratorium, are they taking into account that it actually lowers greenhouse gas emissions to produce it domestically? and creates American jobs and strengthens our economy as opposed to the Russian economy or uh, another economy in which they greater pollute? Are those part of the deliberations? So I do want to clarify that that production has continued onshore and offshore. Um, we're so speaking about new leases, of course. We're speaking about new leases. Okay, I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood. Um, and I am familiar with the, the 2016 report and analysis that you reference. Um, and, you know, ap appreciate what you're saying uh, about it with regard to the analysis that was uh, developed back in 2016. Ms. Daniel Davis, I suspect that um, some of these decisions are being made higher than you. But the only leverage I have right now is to oppose your nomination. And until these, until these answers are given, and it may be March 2nd in which we know, I will speak on behalf of my workers and my economy and the world environment to deliver a message that we don't like where this administration is going. And it's nothing personal. It's entirely for our country and our workers. I yield. Senator Cantwell is next on the list. Is she virtual? No. Um, then Senator King, please proceed. Chair, uh, Ms. Uh, Daniel Davis, uh, Dr. Felgus uh, testified last October that the department was eager to work with Senator Cassidy and I and Senator Whitehouse on the issue of uh, revenue sharing for offshore wind. Uh, eager may have been an overstatement because we haven't heard much on that. Will you commit to me here and now that you will work actively with us on the issue of revenue sharing for offshore wind, which uh, we all believe is a is a future important part of our energy picture. Senator, thank you, and I, and I I do commit if confirmed I'd be pleased to work uh, with you on this really important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Ms. Robinson, I, I've worked a good deal of my professional life in the area of renewables, and I've been a strong advocate for renewables uh, here in the Senate. However, uh, Senator Lankford made an important point, and the question is not getting to renewables. The question is timing. Uh, by the way, I commend to you uh, a, an iPhone app called ISO to go. Uh, and if you don't have it, you probably ought to get it. It tells you on a, a five minute basis what's going on in the New England energy grid and where the power is coming from, what the prices are. Uh, and for example, five minutes ago, uh, gas, natural gas was 57% of the electricity in New England. Nuclear was 26%, renewables 9%, and coal 3%. Uh, I emphasize coal because uh, one of the reasons we we have problems in uh, access to natural gas in New England is not gas supply, it's pipelines. And so the question is really timing. And what do we do to supply energy at a reasonable price on a reliable basis uh, to the people of New England that are now almost 60% dependent upon natural gas if we don't allow additional pipeline capacity to be developed in the expectation of a growth of renewables but it's certainly gonna take uh, a decade or more, Senator Lankford suggested 25 years, it's gonna take a significant amount of time uh, to develop the storage capacity and the generation capacity to make up that gap. So uh, I, I'm not, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I want your thoughts, uh, perhaps more succinct than my question on the, on how do we get from here to there? Thank you so much, Senator. And I do have the ISO to go app. I also have the PJM one uh, and some of the other RTOs have great apps and I encourage everyone watching this to download those, I suppose. Um, so I think the timing is a very important question and certainly there is larger concern on domestic prices for fuel costs sort of broadly and, and then specifically in the New England region. And I'll note at this moment in time- um, Well, also, there are also important environmental questions. If we don't have enough natural gas and we're burning coal to make up the difference, that's an environmental disaster. Um, so I think it's important to note that natural gas pipeline capacity in New England is um, Complete, completely constrained. Um, it, it's being utilized as much as possible. But I do point to some of the um, more fast moving policies that are happening in New England specifically. Um, I will speak a little bit more to Massachusetts because that's my bailiwick. Um, but a lot of the uh, issues relating to New England is that New England relies on natural gas, not just for electricity supply, but for uh, heating and cooling. And as, you know, Governor Baker has a, a whole task force uh, oriented around moving to different varieties of heating and cooling needs, uh, particularly focused on heat pumps. And as that transition happens, as well as greater implementation of demand response, um, and, and other work there, uh, that's going to help alleviate some of the price con concerns and constraints well, I, in the I, immediate I, I certainly, I, I'm with you on, on smart grid and, and microgrids and demand response and all of those. Uh, but I can tell you that one of the uh, parts of the, of the plan for developing a cleaner energy system involves a significant expansion of transmission capacity. And the problem that I'm concerned about is the, is the permitting and the timing of developing that additional transmission capacity. If you think it's hard to put a, a, a pipeline underground through a community, try a high tension line. And as, as Senator Hirono pointed out, two thirds of the people of Maine recently rejected uh, additional transmission capacity for uh, Hydro Quebec. So uh, I, your office has principally been in the, in the research realm, but you're gonna be in deployment and implementation. And I think you're gonna find that this is a significant challenge. I urge you to take the, uh, the challenge of, uh, of developing additional transmission as a very, uh, a very important part of your new position. Thank you very much, Senator. And I, and I certainly do and recognize that it is a challenge, but one that I'm excited to take on. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you, you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. So nice to hear from you. Sir. <laughs> Senator Hyde <Yeah>. Smith. <laughs> you got it. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my question is for Ms. Daniel Davis. 
Here we are again talking about a five-year plan and lease sales within the Gulf of Mexico. I've never seen such slow walking in my life to the detriment of my home state of Mississippi. Referring again, a report prepared during the Obama administration, and I know you served under the Obama administration, looked at greenhouse emissions from offshore operations under various leasing scenarios. Under the no leasing scenario, the report concluded that net greenhouse gas emissions would actually increase as the country would simply turn to imported oil produced in areas with less environmental controls to meet oil demand. Ms. Daniel Davis, what are your views on pausing lease sales and slowing permitting given that this actually hurts the administration's goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by forcing the nation to turn away from cleaner U.S. produced oil. Thank you, Senator. And I, I, I want to you know, reiterate that that leasing is ongoing, uh, onshore and offshore. Of course, the, the 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 court ruling on lease sale 157 has been referenced here. Um, and as as far as permitting, um, that too has been ongoing onshore. So, what is shore. your your answer, and can you tell me, by forcing the nation to turn away cleaner oil that is produced, uh, what are your views on that? So I think I'm um, um, sort of uh, thinking about the role that I have at the department and my awareness around, uh, you know, onshore and offshore production, and that it has continued and, uh, you know, stayed at a level that is historic, which means the revenues coming off royalties have been produced. Uh, you know, people have kept working. Uh, and in fact, I think there's been an up uptick in activity as, as we're coming out of the pandemic. So th that's really my orientation is, is sort of thinking about the role I have at the department and the work that I'm doing with the bureaus on, you know, moving forward with the oil and gas leasing program. So you think that it is appropriate and that you're going in the right direction there. That is your opinion. Well, I do feel that we're moving forward with the leasing program onshore and offshore and that, you know, again, production has continued. Permitting has continued. There are over 9,000 permits available on uh, the onshore public lands that could be utilized. And we've witnessed the Biden administration pleading with Russia and OPEC for oil and natural gas instead of increasing domestic supply. And we continue to dig ourselves into a huge hole by tapping into the strategic petroleum reserve. We know the oil and gas, natural gas will be part of the U.S. energy portfolio for decades to come. So why is the administration so determined on constricting domestic production and forcing us to rely on adversaries for our emergency stockpile? Please make that make sense to me. So the, the Secretary Holland, I know when she appeared before the committee, certainly um, you know con confirmed what you said that oil and gas will be a part of America's energy signature for a while as we move toward a more clean energy economy, and um, I, I just w with sort of production ongoing and, and so many. Um, permits available to drill uh, onshore and, and offshore uh, production where we have uh, leasing areas of up to 70% available that aren't being produced right now. I, I feel like we're in a, a, a position where there is a lot of, um, you know, sort of production activity that can continue. And will DOI timely fulfill its statutory obligation to have a new five-year program in place in a timely manner so there is no gap between the existing plan and the commencement of a new one? So BOEM is absolutely working forward on the next five-year plan. As, as you know, I think probably better than anyone, OXLA is a very uh, prescriptive law, and they are following the process carefully um, so that we get uh, some good outcomes. Do you have any idea of when we can expect it to be finalized? So uh, again, um, you know, BOEM is working carefully on the required analysis. We were in the position when we came in of, uh, I think you're probably aware the previous administration had put forward a plan. It included a number of sensitive leasing areas proposed, you know, Pacific, Atlantic, Florida, um, and then they had not really taken any action for about three years. So um, there is a lot for BOEM to sift through, and we, uh, of course, have overlay of, of um, 
you know, litigation and, and rulings, which actually also in, inform the analysis and look in that they're doing. So I don't have a timeline for you here today, but they are absolutely working forward on it. But I mean, six months, 12 months, 18 months, no idea? So I, I again, this sort of falls into the, um, uh, the deliberative posture with regard to the department and the, the secretary's authorities and decision making, and I'm just not in a position to get ahead of decisions that she would be making with regard to this program. Okay, I think I'm out of time now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for your t time today and your time in public service. Uh, Ms. Daniel Davis, nice to see you again. And Mr. D Dr. D. Carl um, with a name like Hickenlooper, I'm allowed to stumble on other people's names. Um, uh, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, Dr. D. Carl um, I strongly support the vision you laid out, both in your testimony and when we talked earlier, uh, about a more accessible and transparent EIA uh, particularly for long-term outlooks. And as we discussed, I'm kind of a, a nut for data and for making sure that we have information. Um, and we discussed a few things. I'm just going to go down and um, uh, let you say something on these just to make sure that I, I, I think I know where we are, but I just want to make sure. So if you can just tell how you might pursue each of these measures if confirmed as administrator. First, the breaking out renewable outlooks by generation type. Is that... Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the current annual energy outlook uh, basically lumps all renewables together. And in the latest outlook from uh, 2021, renewables in the reference case are over 30 percent uh, and it's sort of an equal share between, I should say, wind and solar together are about 30 percent. And uh, I think it makes sense to, to break those out in, in some of the high level graphics so people can see where, where the energy is coming from. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, what about including renewables in the EIA's annual retrospective review uh, of its annual energy outlook? Yeah, thank you for that question, Senator. I, I agree that as a modeler, it's really important that we reflect on the analysis that we conduct. EIA already performs a retrospective analysis of the annual energy outlook. It's focused exclusively on fossil fuels, and it should continue to, to do that analysis. But I'd also like to see an anal a retrospective analysis of renewables deployment added to that so we understand where we're headed. For, yep. Couldn't agree more. Uh, making models uh, and the input data fully transparent? Y yes, absolutely. I think that's really important to the modeling endeavor. Yeah, so that the whole energy modeling community can have access. Yes. Uh, quantifying communicating uncertainties associated with the forecasts? Yes, ab absolutely. I, I, you know, one of the things I focused a lot on in my career is the role that future uncertainty can play and what we understand about where the energy system is headed. And so I think we need to run the model, the models under lots of different scenarios in order to get insights that are more robust. Right. Uh, and we agree. I mean, that's the, as we discussed, the, there are so many uncertainties that we just have to keep exploring, making sure that we've got a, a better range. Uh, and lastly, directly, directly comparing EIA's total expected shale extraction in its long-term outlooks to relevant EIA uh, and USGS uh, estimates of proven, unproven, and technically recoverable reserves. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I want to use the best available data that, that we have, and that would include looking at shale reserves and, and making sure that we're, we're using the most accurate data available. Great. Perfect. Um, Ms. Robinson, uh, uh, last year... Colorado passed bipartisan legislation requiring all of its transmission utilities to join uh, an organized wholesale market uh, by 2030. As we move forward, or as Colorado moves forward, kind of exploring and developing uh, organized wholesale electricity markets, um, I think they would benefit from working with the Office of Electricity, um, given the office's tools and expertise, as sort of as I understand them, regarding grid. Uh, economic functions, emission modeling, th those things. Uh, if confirmed, um, do you, you anticipate being able to work closely with our office to support Colorado as they seek to expand, organize the wholesale electri electricity markets, not just in Colorado, but throughout the Western United States? Thank you so much for bringing that up, Senator. Um, this is an area that I'm particularly excited to work on, which is state technical assistance. Um, and in particular on the Western RTO, it's in an area that I worked on in a previous position as well. And I know that Nevada has similar 
um, policies in place to move it towards joining a, an organized wholesale market as well as Colorado. So really, I think we recognize that states uh, are maybe not as well funded to do that type of analysis that needs to happen in order to make these important decisions. And so I'd be excited to work with all of you uh, in, in these states that are considering joining an RTO or, or developing a wholesale market with the Office of Electricity's resources. Great. And I think that it's exactly as you said. I think the most states don't have the, the, the not just the, the experience doing this, but they don't have the, uh, the computer uh, modeling and the system set up to do it as easily as what you can. You have the tools. Um, and I guess I'm out of time, so uh, Ms. Danielle Davis, you're off the hook, but I will submit questions to, you can answer at your leisure to the record. <coughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Senator, Senator Daines. Thanks, Chairman Manchin. Ms. Daniel Davis, the last time your nomination was before us was in September, I believe. Uh, that was nine months since the Biden administration illegally paused oil and gas leasing on public lands. It was also three months after a federal judge ruled that the Department of the Interior had to resume leasing. It's February. No oil and gas lease sales have been conducted in Montana. It's an unlawful action. It's hurting local communities. It's killing jobs. In fact, the court found that the leasing ban would cause irreparable injury to states, including Montana. The law is clear. The department must hold quarterly lease sales in each state where lands are available. That is the law. Yet in Montana, all four quarterly lease sales were canceled last year, and a date has yet to be publicly set for this year. My question is, when does the department intend to hold all the illegally paused lease sales that it missed in 2021? So Senator BLM is moving forward, I think you know, uh, with, the, with the leasing process. When I was here in September, we were able to talk about the, the scoping that they were in the middle of. Uh, they also, of course, moved forward with some draft environmental uh, assessments, uh, had the opportunity to extend the comment period, was requested by both industry uh, and the conservation community and did so, and uh, is in the process of analyzing 20 plus thousand uh, comments that, that came in the door. And I, I think I would just reflect that the process, following the process, following the law, um, taking into consideration all of the issues um, in, a, in a sort of a, a careful way is incredibly important given the litigation that we've seen around this program. And that's both onshore and offshore and be sure that we are addressing what we're hearing from the courts with regard to deficiencies in the program as well as, you know, BLM certainly taking into consideration the you know, recommendations that were put forward. Well, we, we've been, we, it's, this is not something that uh, just uh, we invented recently. We've been doing quarterly lease sales for, for a long time. Um, so while I appreciate the comments on process, uh, having spent a lot of time in the private sector, uh, I'm most interested in results. So my question is, will you guarantee that a lease sale will happen in Montana this quarter? There's been plenty of time. So, Senator, I, um, I I'm not I'm a I'm a fan of process. Um, so, I, oh, wait, I don't don't I'm a big process fan. Too. I'm a chemical engineer. I love process. Sure, sure. Process is a means to an end to deliver a result. So, the question is, will there be a lease sale in Montana this quarter? So, again, I mean, BLM is. Uh, looking at and analyzing the comments, they're, they're moving along. I, I am not, um, I, don't, I don't think it would uh, make sense for me to get ahead of a deliberative process. I'm, in, I'm interested in having consistency and certainty associated well, with this a, program. A judge, a judge said this is, what's happening was illegal. It was not following the law. Uh, and my concern is the actions by the department show a blatant disregard for the law. Not only was the initial ban illegal, what we're seeing here is a slow walk. It's a slow walk of the lease sale process since the federal injunction back in June. The department does not have a desire to follow the law. My question then, if confirmed, how can we be confident that you will follow the law? 
So, Senator, I want to assert uh, unequivocally that I will always follow the law. And I do think that being sure in a, in a program that re has received so much litigation and lease sales being remanded repeatedly, I, I'm an, I think it's important for BLM to take the time that it needs to take to get the process right. I want That's the way to provide certainty and consistency for this program and not have operators um, concerned that these lease sales are going to be turned back and open questions about what the next steps are. Well, um, it's, I think there's slow walking going on here, and um, there's been plenty of time to get this right. It's not, it's not a, something we've never done before in doing the lease sales. Let me move on to another area here, which is the 30 by 30 initiative. It's come to my attention that several of my colleagues have urged Secretary Holland to unilaterally designate more wilderness study areas in order to bypass Congress and increase acreage of public land that is managed as wilderness under the guise of the 30 by 30 initiative. The letter states that the intent is to bypass Congress to increase acres managed for wilderness. Ms. Daniel Davis, putting aside the fact that there's millions of acres of existing wilderness study areas that have been studied and recommended unsuitable for wilderness, and I'm not opposed to wilderness. I've passed wilderness bills here, led them. But these are unsuitable for wilderness as Dean, the process that Congress laid out that's not being followed, they're still awaiting congressional action. Do you believe the department has the authority to unilaterally designate more wilderness study areas? So I appreciate that question. I am familiar um, with the letter um, that you reference. And I, I think as far as you know, America the Beautiful and the things that the department is looking at, of course, there's there, we're in the middle of um, a lot of public outreach. It's meant to be um, a bottom-up process that takes into consideration the... But, but does, does the department have the authority unilaterally designate more? That's a, that's a direct question. Yeah, I, I think I'm not uh, in a position to answer that, and I'll have to get back to you. Okay. Well, it, it's the over years and years of precedent here, it's been Congress's authority to designate WSAs, not the department. So I appreciate a response back on that. Thank of you. Of course. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for holding this very important hearing. Uh, Ms. Daniel Davis, good morning, and thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today. Welcome back to the committee. I'd like to talk a little bit about our critical minerals supply chain. We spent a lot of time working to address this semiconductor ship shortage, chip shortage, and last week the House passed our bipartisan plan to invest $52 billion into semiconductor research and manufacturing over the next five years. And uh, I'm working with my colleagues now to get this plan to the president's desk. The, ship, the chip shortage that we are facing is serious. Uh, it's impacting costs and the economy in real time, and it's a national security problem because most of the microchips that are used in this country come from abroad, including adversaries like China. Uh, the same can be said about rare earth elements. These materials are used in advanced technology, including semiconductors, high-powered magnets, fighter jets, medical devices, electric vehicles, wind turb turbines, and batteries. The United States, we once led in rare earths, but now 80% of our rare earth imports come from China. So, Ms. Daniel Davis, I, I raise this issue because Senator Cotton and I introduced legislation that would direct the Defense Department and the Interior Department to begin the process of establishing strategic stockpiles of rare earth elements. This is not a solution, solution chasing a problem. I mean, China disrupted rare earth exports to Japan in 2010 over an East China Sea dispute. And more recently, China threatened shipments to the United States during tensions around, around trade. We need a reserve that can meet our national defense needs in the event of a supply disruption. So, uh, Ms. Daniel Davis, would you agree that more must be done to improve the rare earth supply chain? Senator, thanks so much for that question. Um, 
And I just I want to affirm that the department, um, directed by the president, we are committed to responsible development of critical minerals and rare earth uh, minerals, and understand the importance of their, their use um, uh, across the economy, as as you as you've noted. Um, so I, I do think that we are working together on, as an all of government approach to ensure that you know we're, we're one part of it, um, but we have a lot of partners across the government, including DOE, to uh, ensure that we are undertaking this work, um, you know, in an effective and efficient manner. Could, could you give me some examples of what the Interior Department could do in helping develop this strategic reserve? So I'm going to admit here that I don't have a lot of familiarity with the a, a, you know, approach of development of a reserve. I can tell you that what we're looking at in terms of, you know, responsible development of uh, critical minerals and rare earth minerals on public lands, um, the law that govern, governs it, the 1872 mining law, is a bit archaic. Uh, so it, at, at a minimum, we're trying to uh, be sure that we understand what's out there, um, sort of where the resources are, and where the best opportunities are for sort of lesser conflict areas where we can work together, um, you know, with interests on the ground, you know, states included, to be sure that we're undertaking development in the right way and in an efficient manner. So uh, if confirmed, um would you be willing to work with my office on helping us come up with this plan to develop this strategic reserve of rare earths? Senator, I'd be pleased to, and I'd, I'd be pleased to learn more about the reserve concept as well. All right. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I thank Ms. Robinson for willingness to serve and uh, all the nominees. I uh, wanted to ask you about... Obviously, we're here, you were mentioning in your opening statement about cybersecurity and the need to better fortify the communication layer of the grid. Uh, our colleagues here, Senator Manchin, put forward some language that did just that by building out more fiber opportunity um, on the grid. Fiber not only provides a way to affordably transmit massive amounts of data, it can do so in a physically secure manner. And fiber encased in aluminum strung 40 feet in the air, surrounded by high voltage transmission, is a pretty good security layer for physical attacks, unlike some of our other communication infrastructure that has been targeted over the last year or two. Um, this kind of network can provide a closed loop system, so it's definitely a more secure communication layer than what was currently serving us. And more broadband can empower generators and grid operators with close to real-time data and visibility needed to negotiate and integrate more distributed resources. Um, it gives the data they need to respond to outages and adapt to stream, extreme weather conditions, which is definitely costing all of us, costing us at the local level and certainly at the federal level. Uh, some of these systems with the proper monitoring even can detect wildfire. And as we've seen, this has been a devastating issue in the past. So lighting up dark fiber and building out OPGW along the nation's transmission grid could um, move data needed to modernize our energy system and make our grid more secure. Do you agree that expanding the communications capacity along the grid's existing right-of-way could provide a significant co-benefit for cybersecurity and grid modernization and provide high-speed internet to tens of millions of Americans that currently can't afford to connect to broadband. Thank you so much, Senator. And I, I know this is a, a larger conversation and certainly the Office of Electricity has done, um, produced a, a recent report on dark fiber and will continue to uh, perform a lot of research around that. I wanna point specifically to the smart grid Infrastructure Fund, uh, which was just given uh, several billion dollars in addition uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, and one piece of that does include expansion of broadband in order to support smart grid infrastructure. And I could see there being uh, a real benefit there and, and an opportunity. And I'd, I'd love to continue the discussion with your office uh, to see if, if there's a, a way to make that happen. Okay, do you think that covers investments like cost sharing and building out the fiber? I think that it, assuming that there is a grid aspect associated with it, um, I obviously don't want to step on the toes of our friends over at the Department of Commerce who over, oversee broadband communications, um, but where it does overlap with smart grid communications and, and grid communications writ large. Um, Do you think there are other ways to, um, in, in, you know, 
spur deployment of grid fiber, like per site, you know, providing incentives through FERC or when transmission gets built? Or do you think there are other ways to do this? Because, I mean, I just look at what we've been through on the um, cyber side of the equation, and a lot of resources are spent, and it's, you know, it's amazing how much time our various colleagues on various committees spend on this, particularly armed services. I think they spend a ton of time thinking about this, but in reality, we're talking about fortifying the grid. So do you think there are other ways to build out that communication labor with fiber? Is there other ways to incent? I, I think that there probably are, obviously I won't speak for FERC and, and how they would do that sort of cost allocation work. Um, another area that I admit I'm excited about is being able to do more pilot programs with the Department of Defense um, and, and figuring out what those cybersecurity uh, benefits could be and figuring out how to best um, determine the cost benefit ratio as well, which I think will be important if we're going to figure out how the cost allocation works. Um, on that point, our region led the nation's smart grid demo in 2012, and PNNL just recently, Pacific Northwest Labs, released a report showing that if this technology were used across the country, we could cut peak loads by up to 15 percent and deliver 50 billion in economic uh, benefits to customers. So innovations like this are critical uh, for us moving forward. Um, are these, how would you work with innovation technologies like that to get them better integrated into the grid? So the PNNL study that just came out is on reactive power is a seminal study. I think it really shows um, using Texas as an example, of course, but uh, looks at all of the different ways in which we could optimize the grid in order to provide right, $5 billion in benefits to consumers, which I, I think we all agree is, is a positive thing, as well as tackling a lot of the other issues, be it cybersecurity or emissions that, that we are, are facing at this moment in time. I'll say uh, a partnership between PNNL and um, INL, I think, could be a big component, recognizing the grid testbed that's available over at INL to put not just the theoretical modeling, no offense, um, to, to test uh, and actually do some of that work on the ground at, at Idaho. Uh, so I'd love to talk with you more about ways that we can make that work. I like that suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And we're going to start a second round very quickly because we have votes coming up right now. But Ms. Robinson, I'd like to start a second round with making sure that you're aware that Congress made a very significant investment in modernizing the electric grid by the bipartisan infrastructure bill we just passed. Uh, for example, we updated the DOE designates at the National Interest Electric Transmission Corridors where transmission expansion is most needed. We also included $3 billion to deploy technologies that can make the grid smarter, more flexible, more resilient, and we have a new anchor tenant authority to combine with a revolving loan program for the grid. And I understand you might not be able to speak in current implementation plans, but what I'm asking you is how would you prioritize using these federal dollars to get us the grid we really need without just paying for the investment or grant program. That's why we put, uh, you know, and, and can you speak about the value of transmission, the grid system, basically, and the value of the grid system, and who's receiving that money? Sure. Um, People think that the, basically it's, it flows free across these wires and all that. It very much does not flow free. Is it, is it more profitable than making the power? So when it comes to transmission, we're talking not just about um, – increasing uh, generation opportunities, right? It's also about redundancy and ensuring that sure. reliability is increased, which I think is, is a component that we may not talk about quite as much as we talk about increased access to new resources, right? I think really the question I was going yeah. to everybody was right. do you believe that the utilities have enough uh, revenue coming across those lines to pay back the loan program at no interest to the federal government to try to help them to deploy into areas such as where renewables are going to be expanded. So I, I, I think FERC is has more of the authority over some of that cost allocation work. What I can see potentially are not not necessarily just no interest loans, as you mentioned, but there are opportunities to do matching. Um, I think it's a really good opportunity not to just work. I, I think when we talk about utilities, we talk about uh, investment-owned utilities a lot of the time. But this is a really great opportunity to work with co-ops and municipal uh, utilities as well. I'm just may saying not have that the same should access. we be giving the utilities a grant, federal dollars free, 
to build transmission or should they bar, be accessible to loans? What makes sense? I don't have access to all of the analysis okay. that's available on that right now, I but I, I understand your concern well, about- My concern is we're not going to get free money. Because there's enough money, I know, how, I know how valuable the transmission is. Yes. And they should be paying back the federal treasury and the taxpayers if we loan them the money to build out transmission. With that, I'll go to Senator Murkowski for a second round. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I'll be very brief. Ms. Uh, Daniel Davies, I will, I will share with you, I've been disappointed with some of your answers here today. Um, I think some pretty direct and, and uh, clear questions with regard to the five-year lease sale in, in terms of timing and whether you're going to keep the commitment. Um, we really received nothing there, uh, which is concerning. Um, disappointed in your uh, in your response on the federal oil and gas uh, report and and then when asked multiple times about um, the uh, the um, analysis that was used uh, in the Cook Inlet lease sale 258 and and the relationship with uh, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions uh, recognizing that the no action alternative uh, clearly says that prices are going to be higher due to the to the lower energy supply relative to the proposed action. And, and for those of us in, in states where it's pretty high cost to, to be able to suggest that the department would even consider um, looking at an alternative where it will result in increased energy prices for folks and, and to have the kind of the view of this as, well, that's, that's, something that we're considering. And I understand that no decision has been made in terms of which alternative, but know that there is great concern as we're talking about things like reliability, that affordability is absolutely essential and key as well. Two very quick things here um, that I want to make sure is on your radar screen. We've been working for years now to try to resolve a situation between the BLM and, and several small uh, Alaskan minor uh, miners that um, uh, we tried to address within the Dingle Act. It deals with a small minor waiver and claim maintenance fee. I really need your commitment to work with us on this one. Um, the Chugach Land Study, this is, again, a requirement out of the Dingle Act to look at lands that are suitable for exchange with the Chugach Alaska Corporation. Back in January, we got a response from uh, Director Stone Manning saying she expects the study within the next several weeks. I don't know where the status is on that, but uh, I've got Alaskans in town this week that are wondering, and I don't want to be able to say imminent um, because for them it doesn't mean anything. And I will just end with a statement on public land orders. You know, I've asked multiple times, multiple times, certainly in the last hearing that we had with you, uh, for some, some uh, relevant authority or statute uh, that allows a senior advisor to the secretary to, um, to exercise delegated authority to withhold the public land orders that were previously signed by the Department of Interior. As you know, this has been a longstanding issue with me. We passed my bill, the Alaska Land Transfer Act, Acceleration Act, back in 03. In 06, BLM says all D1 uh, withdrawals should be revoked. In 2008, we saw four of those RMPs completed, but no action taken to revoke these withdrawals. We made some good headway with the Trump administration, but we're, we're again sitting here with no action, basically two year now uh, delay on the PLOs and um, no real action with regards to, to, the, to the regional management plan. So um, uh, my disappointment continues with some of these issues that are key to our state's ability to, to be able to engage in resource production, whether it's big or small. I'm going to end with just a comment to Mr. Uh, Dig Carolis because you've gotten it off easy today, I think. <laughs> Um, but you started in your, um, in your testimony by indicating that you believe that the, uh, the agency, the EIA, should be 
independent and impartial, and as long as you stick to that, we're going to be okay. With that, Mr. Chairman, I know we've got votes and I we know. are way late. Thank you very much. Thank you to the witnesses. Between the two, Senator Cassidy, I know you've been waiting for a second round. Do you have a quick question you want to go? You want to go? Okay, go ahead. Turn your microphone on, sir. Ms. Daniel Davis, I'm concerned about the uh, lease sales and how that went down in terms of the uh, environmental groups. Um, uh, you, uh, you have told that, uh, Mr. Chairman, you've told some of us that you're concerned about the lack of leasing being undertaken by the department. I also want to point out something with respect to lease sale 257 and the legal challenge. Uh, Ms. Daniel Davis, on, on August 31st at 3.23 p.m., you electronically signed the record of decision for lease sale 257, correct? Now, um, less than four hours later, uh, the record of decision was signed. Three uh, uh, less than four hours later, three environmental groups filed a 52-page complaint in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. You sign it. Four hours later, a 52-page complaint is filed. Now, I'm not an attorney, but for the plaintiffs to have to review the record of decision, drafted, finalized, and filed, and then do 52 pages, thoroughly reviewed and agreed to with citations and signed, seems a little bit, wow, they may have had some indication this was coming. The Louisiana Attorney General's Office has also given us information regarding the timing of this filing on the part of the plaintiffs. Ms. Daniel Davis, did you coordinate with anyone from outside the department, including the plaintiffs, with respect to the record of decision for lease sale 257? So I did not. And Senator, I just want to point out one of the features of the decision that the judge made on 257 a couple weeks ago is that our administration relied on the record developed for that record of decision by the previous administration. So it is something that had been out there in the, the sort of the public realm for months at that point. So I just, I just think that's an important point that I want to make. That's an important make. point. I accept that as an important point. Nonetheless, do you know of anybody within the department, aside from yourself or the administration, who coordinated with or shared information with the plaintiffs or any other interested party regarding the publication of the uh, record of decision for the lease sale 257? I'm not aware of anything, sir, no. Okay. Um, with that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hovind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Daniel Davis, um, as gas prices continue to rise, shouldn't we be doing more to make U.S. production more competitive, including holding lease sales on federal lands? So, Senator, I appreciate that question, and we are moving forward with the lease sale process both onshore and offshore. When you say moving forward, does that mean having uh, auctions and, and getting this going, not just continuing to uh, delay? So I think I want to just reiterate the importance of appropriate process with regard to lease sales. I think we saw what happened in lease sale 257 and the defects identified by the judge. Also onshore, there's been a, uh, quite a bit of litigation activity with similar concerns and others raised, and I'm very, very interested in BLM undertaking a complete process and a full review and following the law. I would rather them get it right um, and provide some consistency and certainty to operators and others in this program. Well, do you think it's acceptable that these policies are discouraging or delaying U.S. production, increasing our reliance on energy from places like Russia and Saudi Arabia, other OPEC countries? The average price of gasoline now is up to $3.50 a gallon, high inflation. Um, is that acceptable? So the data that I've reviewed, and again, this is only about um, onshore and offshore production on federal public lands and waters, doesn't actually suggest that production has slowed or been curtailed. In fact, in some cases, it has risen as we're coming out of the pandemic. Well, in my state of North Dakota, our lease sales are being held up on federal lands. Our production is down from 1.5 million barrels a day down to about 1.1 million barrels a day. So that would contradict what you just said. Not to mention the price of gasoline being up more than a dollar over the last year. How does that, how do those two correlate? Energy so, production in our country is down, not up. We're importing more oil from Russia, from Russia, not less. 
So again, I'm aware, at least, and I'm really responsible for, for public lands and waters, that in fact production has continued uh, at sort of the regular pace uh, that's been you know, sort of historically seen in terms of, and again, there's over 9,000 uh, permits available to drill on onshore public lands. You know, 70% of the OCS lands that are leased are not currently in production. So again, when I look at what's in my area of responsibility, I do see that that production uh, is moving forward. Uh, royalty revenue is continuing to, to produce and permits are uh, continuing to be approved. Sure, because it takes time for you to hold those lease sales and actually get that into production. So. You can argue that you're not seeing that decline. You're creating the decline, though. You don't acknowledge that. So I do. I, I just want to reiterate that the, the the leasing program is moving forward. And again, I, I'm very interested in working with BLM and BOEM on a process that doesn't lead to defects being identified by judges and really sort of putting at risk sort of the certainty that we want to see in that program for operators and others who count on that revenue. So that's sort of my orientation um, to the to could the you, question you're asking. Could you get us some timelines? in terms of when we're actually going to see more lease sales. Do you have any kind of timelines or Gantt chart so we, rather than just saying, well, we're moving forward, but we're doing all these reviews? Can you get us some timelines? So again, I, I think much of the ongoing activity is, is deliberative in nature, and I'm happy to go back to the department and um, figure out how we can get you the information that you need. Thank you. Uh, and then Ms. Robinson, um, do you agree that reliability is a critical issue and that coal continues to be an important part of baseload power. Thank you, Senator. I agree with you 100% that reliability is a major concern, and certainly we're seeing that with more weather events happening as well, that it's both reliability and resilience. Um, and certainly there's going to be a role for firm dispatchable power, whether it's coal, whether it's natural gas, hydropower, hydrogen, geothermal storage, or so on and so forth. And when it comes to the Office of Electricity, the Office of Electricity is um, source neutral. Uh, and so looking forward to ensuring that there's reliable electricity from whatever source. How about natural gas and having adequate pipeline capacity to move it around the country? Certainly, there, there's conversations to be had about natural gas um, capacity, um, having conversations about what's going on and specifically in New England, where I, I think there are probably some more constraints than, than we see in other locations and how it impacts consumers. So happy to continue that conversation uh, with you moving forward, if confirmed. And Mr. DeCarlos, thank you for visiting on the phone. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say this to all three of you. Thank you so much for coming in, and, and we appreciate very much. Uh, Dr. DeCarlos, you haven't had a chance to, because you know what? Uh, there's a lot more interest, as you can tell, in how we get the power to your house and how we make the power. Uh, we want you, and we have all the confidence, I, I think, that, that you can see that the confidence this committee had in you making sure we get the accurate information to make the decisions we have to make, and we rely on that, and I think it's a your job is probably one of the most important jobs that we rely on, the information you give us. Do you have anything you'd like to say while we're closing? I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to serve. You're, you're going to do great, all of you are. Let me say uh, to Ms. Dan, Daniel Davis, I think what we're trying to say is that we know the previous administration acted very swiftly and quickly and sometimes maybe too hastily. And we saw some uh, some problems. We've identified those problems. What we were concerned about is they weren't fixed or help help the applicants fix them before they went to court. And we knew it. It's pretty much like we knew what the court outcome was going to be, but we let it happen. We're not blaming you. We understand there's other powers to be, and we're uh, honing in on that pretty hard. What we don't want to do is work with you to, to identify any problems there might be in future leasing and things that's going on right now that you thought the way it was. The way, if, if I was the applicant, you were telling me this would be fine, I think you should do it this way, and you know it's not fine, and you know the courts will react differently, then come and help me and say, Joe, I think you need to change. You need to change your application or basically up, uh, improve it. That's what we were, I think that's where everybody was coming from, and um, I wanted to bring that up. So let me just say this. Again, we appreciate uh, all your attentive today and you're willing to, uh, to serve. I think that's most important. Uh, but members are going to have until 6 p.m. tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. And with that, committee is adjourned.